Hello and welcome to the I2I Community Benefits and Procurement Webinar. I'm Julie Nicholas, Policy Manager at CIH Cymru. Today we will be explaining the principles of the CanDo Toolkit and offering you the chance to ask questions directly to members of the I2I team. Joining us today, we have Rachel Morton and Gareth Jones of I2I, who will tell you all about the principles and successes of our pioneering housing investment project. Funded by Welsh Government and delivered by CIH Cymru, I2I has had to create over 3,700 jobs and training opportunities by offering hands-on support and online resources to maximise the returns on housing investments. We're also joined by John Barnes, who is producing this webinar for CIH Cymru. I'm now handing you over to Gareth Jones, who will begin the presentation. Thank you, Julie. Um, as Julie said, my name is Gareth Jones, and I work as an I2I coordinator for the Chartered Institute of Housing. I2I is a, a Welsh government-funded arms-length project managed and located at the Chartered Institute of Housing, Cymru. It was established to support the housing sector to reach the Welsh Housing Quality Standard and to assist with stock transfer ballots. We work between the government and the housing sector to maximise the benefits of housing and regeneration spend across Wales, to disseminate best practice in housing, to deliver innovative procurement projects across Wales, and to improve tenant and service user engagement mechanisms. Now the two documents that uh, you should see on screen are I2I's can-do toolkits. Uh, the one you can see on the left, the red one, is the basic toolkit. The one on our right is our second toolkit dealing with procurement for small and medium enterprise. Uh, we don't really have enough time to go into the, uh, the second toolkit, which is uh, on small and uh, medium enterprise, uh, but we can run future webinars on this if, uh, if the demand requires it. But I'll just run through it in simple terms. In simple terms, it deals with flexible procurement, uh, different size contracts and criteria, uh, division of large contracts into lots, um, don't think that large contracts only mean uh, large lots. This, if, if you sort of separate things into smaller lots, it would probably be more appealing to small and medium enterprise. Uh, also deals with framework contracts, direct appointments and mini competitions, and uh, offers some hints on simplif simplification of the paperwork, how to cut costs, and to encourage SMEs to bid. So, four years on, uh, I2I has assessed the effectiveness of the toolkit since it was drafted four years ago, and to date, the toolkit has been instrumental in helping the housing sector create 3,765 job and training opportunities across Wales. Uh, compared to other, other government budgets, such as health and education, housing spend in Wales is relatively small, yet the housing sector has managed to create nearly 4,000 job and training opportunities. Uh, in Wales, we abide by the same EU procurement rules as everyone else, but we also use our procurement to harness the added benefits for our communities. Some organisations have raised questions while we've been doing this on the legality of the toolkit, um, i.e. can we legally compel a contractor to include community benefits as a con contract condition. Uh, rest assured that the toolkit has been drafted with the help of solicitors, and the Welsh Government has also worked with Morgan Coal solicitors this year to refresh uh, the legal advice. Um, it does remain the same. so. Uh, you, you do have permission to include community benefits in your procurement processes. Okay, community benefits. So what are they? Um, basically, job and training opportunities are considered uh, a gold standard of community benefits. Um, we also uh, call this TR and T, or targeted recruitment and training. The targeted in that recruitment, meaning that you target it towards those communities or groups of individuals that you are seeking to support. Um, some contractors might get a little bit nervous uh, when you mention the word trainees. Quite often it has a negative connotation to them of uh, inexperienced people that are wet behind the ears, It'll be of little uh, use to them, they'll have to spend a lot of time training. Uh, this is not necessarily the case. Um, obviously we know that not all young trainees are, are like that even, but um, quite often the people that you might be targeting for those opportunities would be experienced people who've been out of work for some time uh, and they need a little push to, um, to help them return to the labour market. Um, while jobs and training may be a gold standard in community benefits, uh, it doesn't, it's not the be all and end all. There are other benefits that can be included, um, such as work uh, experience placements, 
um, advertisement, job vacancies in local contexts, mentoring, cash sums for community projects, or even uh, something as small as attendance at community fairs or school fairs to promote employment. I to I can help with um, with giving you some idea of, of those community benefits. We have a menu of community benefits that can assist you with it, which is uh, available from our website. Uh, the address of which should be on the bottom of the slides that you can see on your screen now. As you can see on this slide, the legislative background. Uh, the EU directive shows that that there's clearly an appetite for social and environmental improvements through procurement. Uh, and this is also supported by the Social Value Act 2013. There's been a, a huge amount of support for the idea in Wales, uh, particularly from Jane Hutt AM, and you can see uh, her procurement statement or an excerpt of it uh, on the screen now. Um, she stated that community benefits should be considered wherever possible in, in procurement in order to add the maximum value for every pound spent in Wales. And in this quote, you can see validation for eye to eyes work in this field from Hugh Lewis, who's the former Minister for Housing. Uh, he promotes the idea of using the Can Do Toolkit as a benchmark model for Wales, and indeed to open this out beyond the Welsh border, and also possibly to introduce it to other areas other than housing. Uh, one thing I should point out is uh, don't be afraid to ask contractors what they can offer you in terms of community benefits, and don't underestimate the capacity and enthusiasm of contractors to deliver them. Contractors and wheels have really taken the social causes uh, in the last couple of years, and when Mark intenders, we receive really, really good ideas from uh, contractors. So if you let the contractors give you those ideas, they may well come up with something that you hadn't even thought of. So why not just go with the cheapest tender? Um, as with anything that you're procuring, the uh, cheapest option is not necessarily the best value for money. And, and the whole point of the can-do approach is to get as much added value as possible into your contracts. Consider your, your customer satisfaction and involvement, and recognize that different people attach value to different things. So for example, even if you have uh, a community that you want to do some work in that is primarily um, consistent of elderly people, uh, you may uh, at first glance, not think that uh, the job opportunities and training would be the most appropriate thing to put in those communities. But um, if you consult with those communities, you may find that uh, they welcome job opportunities for their children and grandchildren who maybe haven't had those opportunities in the past. So don't immediately dismiss ideas as being inappropriate without thinking them through and consulting with those people it's going to affect. Um, given con constrained public expenditure, high levels of employment at the moment, especially in, in the light of uh, welfare reforms, it's more important uh, now than ever um, to, uh, to address community well-being uh, and regeneration. And housing providers are in a, a unique position to be able to do that. Um, quite often, though, we find with some of the organizations that we work with, whether they be housing associations or local authorities, that they have departments that are trying to address lack of employment and skills in communities, but they also have other departments then which are responsible for maintenance contracts, and we find sometimes that those, uh, those departments don't necessarily work in ha hand, in a, uh, hand in hand. So you would get uh, a, a maintenance contract which is worth thousands, perhaps millions of pounds. Um, and could represent plenty of jobs and training opportunities, but those are not being exploited because people are not buying into this agenda. Can do would help uh, address that for your organization. And that uh, diagram on the screen is uh, the can do approach in a nutshell. Um, it's uh, those four, four things, contractor, support agency, community, and the client all working together on the can-do toolkit and uh, uh, embedding its, its principles and uh, making sure they get the best value for that, that community. And as I said before, it's not just housing. Uh, there are uh, other departments, other organizations that can have an effect with this. Education, highways, local authorities have even taken the can-do approach uh, and uh, embedded it as a corporate approach. So. Now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Rachel Morton, who will take you through the step-by-step uh, -step process um, of the Can-Do Toolkit. 
Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, my name's Rachel. I am going to take you through the step-by-step -step of the nuts and bolts of how you put community benefits into contracting. You'll probably have worked out by now that this presentation is largely on a background of social housing. Uh, so much of the reference is to construction contracts, um, but recently housing has been working more on community benefits in service contracts. I'll put in a disclaimer here that, that this presentation isn't going to constitute legal advice, so if you're uh, seriously considering putting it in, we would recommend taking legal advice on community benefits in procurement. Um, we're not presuming any level of understanding of procurement here. The people who are implementing community benefits range from community development officers, quantity surveyors, regeneration project officers, housing managers, in short, anyone who has involvement in putting something out to tender. Even if they're not putting the tender paperwork together, often the client department could have the opportunity to specify what they want by way of community benefits and who they want to benefit. So it could fall to, for example, the tenant participation officers to inform the process. It is important that each organization, each client, each purchaser decides if and how to include social clauses in their procurement through each of the following steps. And we shall go through these one by one. OK, first up is policies and powers. The first question you want to ask yourself is, do we, as an organization, have the powers to put community benefits into our contract? Now, if you're a local authority, you will have powers under the well-being provisions. This is the local authorities um, can do anything they consider to promote or improve the economic, social, or environmental well-being of their area or persons in it. And this power is in force in Wales. Registered social landlords generally have powers under their regeneration and community development objectives. Um, as an example, RCT Homes Constitution commits the organization to promoting community involvement and to supporting economic regeneration and development of the communities it serves. So for other organizations, check your governing documents, your constitution, objects, memorandum and articles of association. Um, it, procurement policies, for example, to see what powers you have to, to put these in. We were speaking to Anthony Collins solicitors in Birmingham this week. They're a recognized authority in this area. And they said that there is interest from English authorities in drafting social value policies to formalize community benefits and targeted recruitment and training in line with the requirements of the Social Value Act that we mentioned earlier. It's probably a good point here to cover the concept of core and non-core community benefits. If you have the powers, as a contracting authority, you can put community benefits in as a core requirement. This means that they are referred to throughout the tendering process. It's part of what's being tendered for, part of the substance of the contract. So it can be scored during the evaluation process and monitored the same as any other contract condition. Non-core or voluntary means a schedule of community benefits are agreed after the preferred contractor is selected in the contract sign. It cannot form any part of the uh, selection of the contractors. Both have a role in community benefits. Core is ideal for those community benefits that are easily quantifiable, like training days, number of new employees, holding X number of meet the buyer events, etc. Non-core works quite well for added community benefits, initiatives such as working with local residents to paint a community hall, donating prizes to raffles, something that's difficult to quantify but good for corporate social responsibility work. We recommend using a core approach to community benefits because then it's in the contract, it's in from the start, and it is enforceable as any other contract term. Business case. If you're putting together a business case either for having community benefits in your organization as a whole or specifically for a specific project, say a new build, um, consider community benefits as early as you can. For a start, you must have corporate or board buy-in. Without it, it will be impossible to achieve realistic community benefits. But we found generally that boards, councillors, senior managers, they're all very positive about community benefits. What is, is more difficult is getting effective delivery mechanisms on the ground. You will need to have resources to deliver and monitor it. It, it can't be an add-on on the top of someone's full-time position. They need to be able to dedicate a percentage of their working week to community benefits. Um, very few organizations have dedicated community benefits or tier 2 officers. Uh, a, a lucky few do. Um, 
some have committed procurement teams who take on responsibility for community benefits. I name check uh, Swansea, Powers and Caerphilly councils for their very proactive um, procurement departments. For most organizations, however, it's advisable to have a, a champion, not necessarily to do all the community benefits work, but to ensure that it's coordinated. What you'll find in, in housing, for example, for a new development is that the tenant participation or community regeneration team will have the information on what community benefits they want and who they're targeting. The development or procurement staff would do the nuts and bolts of putting it in the tender process. And the project officers on, on site would be monitoring it in, in their weekly meetings. The champion would be collating all this information and ensuring that all aspects, particularly the monitoring, are being done. Um, back to considering tenant involvement. Do you want to involve your tenants or non-housing, the people who use your services in the tender process? I to I have been delivering training to tenant representatives on participating in procurement, covering the, the sorts of things that we're talking about today, but in more detail. Um, their eventual input is informed and valuable, and we've got really good feedback from um, the organizations that we've delivered this with, that they, they can give an opinion of service delivery from a recipient's point of view. Um, consider who are your target beneficiaries for any TR and T opportunities. In housing, we have a current wave of tenant profiling exercises, which should allow people to determine what type of group needs to be targeted. For example, single parents, is it ethnic minorities, is it meets those not in employment, education or training, for example. You can also access deprivation statistics or labor market statistics to give you an insight on, on your potential beneficiaries. Because if you're requiring your contractors to provide opportunities, you need to know that you have people to fill those opportunities. Consider what resources you have available. Do you have dedicated staff to put towards community benefits? Do you have buy-in from your procurement officers, if you have procurement officers? Are the development teams fully aware of community benefits and prepared to monitor them during the contract? Do you have additional funding to put towards training if necessary, if it's part of your corporate strategy and you want to go down that route? What community benefits are realistic and achievable? A six-month new build isn't going to deliver 10 apprenticeships. You aren't going to be able to target construction skills experience for lone parents if you don't provide or, or have access to providing, for example, support with childcare. Know your potential beneficiaries, know your area, and what kind of opportunities you can realistically provide. So the ultimate question, which makes an informed client, which is you, is do you know what it is that you want? Okay, when you enter the first formal part of the tender process, you may have to issue a notice in the official journal of the European Union. Check the thresholds, and if you're required to go through the OJU, put in a reference to community benefits in the notice. It doesn't have to be detailed at this stage, just an indication that the community benefits will form part of the contract. So, for example, if it's part of your corporate strategy, you've decided to take it on, you will be procuring 500 new kitchens and targeted recruitment and training. Now, a, a quick look through um, online um, OG notices. Um, not many people are doing it at the moment. They're still putting in the title just, for example, the 600 new kitchens. So the next clause is found more commonly under the um, additional contract information. Um, the successful contractor will be required to participate in the achievement, blah, blah, blah. That is, is a very commonly used phrase, that one, and, and people seem to be happy with it. Avoid, if we haven't said before, avoid using the word local with regard to labor contractors, subcontractors, because this could be seen as discriminatory to other countries in the EU. Now, the next stage would be the pre-qualification questionnaire, if you're doing one. You, don't have to, you may not be going through the step of a, of a PQQ. Um, but if you are, it, it's there to determine the capacity before you issue a limited number of invitations to tender. So it's based on previous performance. You don't refer to the current contract in your questions. So what you would do under this is, is under the um, technical capacity questions, you would ask some questions on previous involvement in community benefits. And there are some up there. Um, other examples would be, what's your experience of promoting supply chain opportunities to SMEs and social enterprises? What's your experience of promoting equality of opportunity in your organization? 
and you can assess them on their, their previous experience of it. The next step, the invitation to tender, and the requirements for community benefits, and this is a legal requirement, these five steps, is that they are clearly defined, measurable, relevant to the subject matter of the contract, achievable and proportionate to the size of the contract. So clearly defined, for example, do not ask as a question, what nice things can you do for the community? Um, or what community benefits can you give us? Because that's not sufficiently clearly defined. Do ask, for example, how many weeks work experience and in what areas can you provide employment? Um, ask for a method statement on how they will deliver these commitments to TRT. How will you support your trainees to maximize their chances of successfully completing their training? Now, they can be open questions, such as bidders are required to demonstrate how they would create employment opportunities in the area of contract operation. Or they could be closed questions, such as the main contractor will be required to recruit one long-term unemployed person per million pounds project value. Please demonstrate how you would achieve this. Um, relevant to the subject matter of the contract, please try and keep it to what the contract is about and what the contractor can do. For example, probably not a good idea to ask the contractor to build six houses and also provide horse riding lessons for disadvantaged children because you're probably drifting too far from what the purpose of the contract is. At this stage, you provide an information sheet to the contractors with support agencies. This is where you need to do your research so that you know what support agencies are available in your area. For example, do you have the Shore Trusts operating, Working Links, a, a high, local higher education college? Do you have contact information on there which is effective and they can contact those organizations to get support? Um, Put in a disclaimer, there's a disclaimer available in the CanDo Toolkit online. It says something along the lines of the inclusion of TRT requirements does not comprise or apply any promise on the part of the employer or their agents, etc., etc. So it, it removes any um, legal responsibility on your part in that one. Contract award. Now at this stage you'd for the successful contractor you'd discuss requirements and the monitoring that you're going to be in, in putting in place. If you haven't put it in as a core requirement, at this stage you would negotiate appropriate community benefit on a voluntary basis with the contractor. Implementation and monitoring. Cannot say this often enough. Do it early, do it often. Monitoring is so essential. It's the one thing we've been, we've been pushing very much recently because to reinforce the whole process, it has to be adequately monitored and you'd be amazed at how much this slips sometimes. Do it early, do it often so you can hold the contractor to those commitments that he's made. Put them in as key performance indicators so that they can be monitored on site at the weekly or bi-weekly site meetings. Only request the information that you actually need. Don't go requesting reams of information from the contractor to get on any trainees if you don't actually need it for a specific purpose. That's where you come up to consider the Data Protection Act and what sort of information you're transmitting around the place, particularly electronically. In terms of monitoring, if you're in Wales and you're in the public sector, the Value Wales Community Benefit Measurement Tool is recommended. Value Wales are the procurement arm of the Welsh Government. They produce a very user-friendly community benefit measurement tool which is spreadsheet and covers those sorts of things that the Welsh Government is, is um, quite heavily interested at in the moment in terms of local employment, local SMEs, environmental considerations, recycling, etc. And don't forget support for your contractors in entering into this process, particularly as it benefits SMEs. Meet the buyer events are very useful to explain the requirements of the contract and community benefits so they know what's expected. Signpost potential contractors to the relevant agencies in Wales, that would be Business Wales. And you can consider putting in supply chain opportunities as community benefits. So your main contractor would be employing local companies, SMEs, as supply chain. Now we've got a few slides, just three more slides here on equality of opportunity. Now, Here we're talking about demonstrating how we're dealing with anti-poverty and pro-equalities issues. Now this was part of the Equalities Act, but the Westminster government has dropped this particular duty. 
Um, however, the Welsh Government have signalled that they are committed to continuing with it. I'll give you a moment to read a few points on that slide. Um, so there's going to, there is reference to it in the moment in the Sustainable Development Duty White Paper. Um, so it's, it's been indicated by Hugh Lewis that it's going to be continued in Wales, that there will be positive duty to promote equality of opportunity. It's going to apply to those organisations, those public sector organisations which are listed there on the screen. It's not in now, but it will be coming in. And there's a good opportunity if you're doing community benefits to use it to promote equality of opportunity and to consider who your beneficiaries are, what sort of groups you're targeting, and how this will promote equality of opportunity. Okay, um, Hugh Lewis, former Communities in Tackling Poverty Minister, said the Welsh Government wants to retain the socio-economic duty in order to make a meaningful difference to the lives of citizens and communities. We want the power commenced in Wales regardless of what the UK government plans are. Given the clear links between socio-economic inequalities and those associated with particular protected characteristics, the public sector equality duty and the socio-economic duty together will reinforce and support each other. So partnership working is key to delivering now. CIH Cymru and Ty Powell, the Housing Inequalities Organisation, will be producing a briefing on this shortly. That's the end of my presentation and I will hand you back now to Julie for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth and Rachel. We now have about 25 minutes for questions that you would like to ask or comments that you'd like to make about I2I and community benefits and procurement. Our producer, John, is going to invite you now to speak or, um, and please can you remember to click on the put your hand up button if you want to ask directly and you've got access to a microphone or phone or alternatively you can type your text into the questions section on your screen if you prefer John to read out the questions on your behalf. John do we have any questions yet? We've got nothing at the moment. Um, I have a question that I'd like to um, ask Rachel and Gareth just to, just to kick things off really which was something that came up the other day. Um, Rachel, you said that for the invitation to tender, the requirements must be relevant to the subject matter of the contract. Could you give a bit more of an explanation about this? Um, yeah, thanks, Julie. <laughs> um, I'd rather not, but here goes. Um, in terms of uh, the, the relevant legal case here is, is um, Weinstrom, um, in terms of European law, there is a precedent for this where the, the tender was going to evaluate what renewable energy was going to be produced um, for consumers above and beyond the amount required for the actual contract. So it was, it was judged to be not related to the subject matter of the contract because it wasn't part of the, 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 the clear definitions of the operation of the contract. However, and this comes back to powers, if your organization has the remit to benefit the community, then generally community benefits are going to be related to the contract, if you take my point. Um, what you want to avoid is anything that is too far removed from what the contractor usually does. Um, and I mean, contractors usually employ people, they usually have trainees, they usually do some form of corporate social responsibility. These aren't outside the realms of what contractors are usually doing anyway to be safe. Um, particularly, you, you want to avoid anything that might prejudice other contractors in other European countries. So coming up with something as a community benefit that, that a contractor hypothetically from Germany would find it difficult to fulfill because they're not on the ground in the local area. I hope that's clear. It is a difficult legal point and there has been much written on it. So um, I wouldn't get, if, if you stick to the fairly standard norms of community benefit, you shouldn't fall foul of this because it's, um, it's, it's fairly well recognized about sustainability and community benefits. 
The next question is going to come from Kerry. Kerry, uh, could you introduce yourself and uh, your organization as well, if applicable? Hello, Kerry. Sounds like we might have a problem there with the audio. Um, she has actually submitted a question to me as well, so I'll ask it. Uh, do you have any examples of community, community benefits provided through support or care contracts? And that's to anyone on the panel. Hi, Kerry. Um, it's a really good question. At the moment, we're just beginning to explore what the opportunities are for service contracts. Um, the I2I project was set up by Welsh Government predominantly to help um, social housing providers achieve uh, the Welsh Housing Quality Standard. So it's very much about um, housing capital um, funding, really, um, new, new kitchens, bathrooms, etc. What we're really excited about, and this links in very much with the new equalities, duties, and anti-poverty um, priorities that Welsh Government um, have now identified is how, how we can maximize community benefits in service related contracts because there, there are huge con these are huge contracts that we're talking about across local authorities particularly but also around health boards and, and other public sector services so at the moment the answer is that no we don't but what we do want to do is to start exploring them to look at what good practice we have at the moment that we can transfer over and what additional work needs to be done I don't know if anyone else wants to comment or come in on that. I mean, I, I have to say myself, I, I don't know much about that particular sector. The things that, that spring to mind, obviously, are work experience opportunities that could be given to people, um, promotion of it as, a, as a, a career area in schools, mentoring in schools, that sort of thing. I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly fairly easy, but I don't know what sort of level of of employment is required in that particular area as to whether you could take on any actual paid trainees. But it'd be definitely something worth looking into. Um, and there should be email contacts at the end if you want to email that question. And we could have a discussion about it. Uh, Kerry's actually just sent me a slight sort of uh, amendment, to, uh, not amendment, additional comment there. She said, a current local authority PQQ for support or care is asking for non-core CB as part of the PQQ. Does the panel have anything to add on that front? Yeah, so this is Julia again. You can probably tell because I'm the non-Australian one. Um, I think it's quite exciting actually because when we're talking about the targeted recruitment and training that's been undertaken today, if we start looking at and assessing and evaluating the people who've benefited from that, um, we're probably going to find that there are certain groups of people that have been underrepresented. And so when we're looking at service contracts, we're probably looking at opportunities to benefit groups of people that haven't... Um, maybe had as many options with the um, WHQS related, the housing related um, opportunities through community benefits. So I'm thinking particularly around opportunities for women um, who might not want to get into um, what would be perceived as traditional male jobs, although that's not true for women. We certainly have had women getting into apprenticeships. But if it's particularly if you're talking about service area contracts um, and more office-based opportunities, more flexible um, working, etc. then I think that there's a huge opportunity there. And essentially what we're doing is we're exploring it now. Um, so it's quite an exciting time to be involved. Um, yeah, I just add to that, obviously, that the local authority is, is, and it's good to see, is fulfilling their duty under the Social Value Act, which has recently come in, which is to consider in their contracting, whether it's suitable to include community benefits, and obviously they've decided that it has. You say that it's come in as a, as a non-core requirement, but again, it's good to see that they're putting it in as early as the PQQ, that they will be looking for it, so you have lots of time to pre prepare for it. Um, I mean, I'd suggest, you know, p p potentially you could contact them and, and ask them what sort of community benefits they were thinking of. Don't underestimate as well the sort of community benefits that contractors and service providers may have been doing anyway, because if it's going in for the PQQ and you, you're putting down a history of what you've delivered, look at 
putting down what you've achieved by way of local employment, if you've got any supply chain and you've been delivering to local firms, if you've been doing any environmental recycling, if you've been doing any sort of um, training or work experience, speaking to schools, anything like that, that you may have been doing through corporate social responsibility or just because you're nice people. Don't underestimate that you put that in, it makes a case for you having a history of doing community benefits because a lot of, particularly a lot of SMEs don't recognize the community benefits that they're already doing. They don't see it as something called community benefits. They just see it as the sort of stuff they do day to day anyway. Okay. Hi, we haven't had any more questions in from um, attendees at the webinar. So if you do have a question, you know, just type away and we'll ask it out for you. We're not going to force you to ask us directly. Um, I appreciate that for a lot of people this will be a new concept, so it might be that um, you're a bit trying to, trying to catch up with what we've said and, and haven't got to the stage where you're asking questions. We have only got um, an additional 15 minutes to run on the webinar. Um, so if anyone's got any comments, any experiences that they would like to t tell us about, we're particularly interested in, in case studies and collecting good practice, anything like that. Or if, you want, if you're not sure about anything that we've talked about and you'd like us to go back on it, we can do that as well. Yeah, if I could add to that, Julie, we're working on a refresh of the original Can Do Toolkit at the moment. Um, we're in discussions with Anthony Collins solicitors about updating it. We've had um, a good number of practitioners over the last five years of Wales have been working very, very closely with community benefits. So we're, we're seeking to put together their learning on, on how it's best implemented and doing a refresh. As you can imagine, it's in the context of the change of the EU procurement rules and, and the Social Value Act. Um, you know, the landscape has changed somewhat and, and people have accepted it a lot more. Um, but the refresh, we're taking various parts of it. We've, we've updated the format and we've got new sections now which we're going to be putting up separately of the, the whole publication just as individual one-offs on the website around things like some questions to ask at an initial community benefit meeting, um, information on shared apprenticeship schemes in Wales, because there's some very big um, movements around shared apprenticeship schemes. We're not getting the large three-year contracts um, that we formerly got in housing, which, which were ideal for taking on apprenticeships. Um, and for smaller contracts, they've, they've proved to be very good for taking on displaced apprentices or part of apprentices. So you can get contractors taking on an apprentice for a short amount of time and moving on. Um, and there's information on those. There's also a section of FAQs gleaned from the experiences that we've had over the last five years of delivering this training as to what comments come up most often from those people asking about it. So those will be up on the website hopefully today, if, if failing that by the end of the week, but uh, keep an eye out for those because we'll be updating them and promoting them as they go on. We've just had quite an interesting question slash sort of comment, for, again from Kerry, uh, wondering whether it would be an opportunity for Cumorth to feed into the refresh, uh, including that support, care, sort of social enterprise side of things as well. Um, have you got any comment on that, Rachel? Yes. <laughs> I think that sounds great. I, I think it would be really, really helpful. As I said, we're only just moving into um, service contracts rather than contracting for, for builds, straight builds and refurb on properties. So um, yeah, definitely send us an email and it would be great to talk about it. Yeah, I'd like to chip in there as well because um, my background is, is supporting people and Comorth is the representative body for housing related support providers in Wales. I think it's a really exciting opportunity um, when we're looking at the new supporting people framework and the, um, the regional approach to uh, commissioning. There's a real opportunity here to start maximising community benefits and particularly around targeted recruitment and training for those service users. Um, and, and their families and, and other people around the service users to, to benefit from community benefits. These are people who probably have been excluded from the traditional um, community benefit procurement process. So I think, yes, there's a lot of work to be done there. It all links in with the service um, area contracts, and I think it's a real opportunity. Okay, um, I've got another question then. 
Um, I was wondering, because you talked a bit about the monitoring of community benefits um, contract, the community benefits aspect of contracts and how important it is to get it right earlier, earlier on. And I just wondered, um, how, how do you do that? Um, what, what are the problems around not doing it that people have experienced? And how do you do it well and make sure that you are getting the value out of the contract that you're supposed to be? Well, one of the obvious problems, and, and I think this is, this is um, a problem from early, the early days of community benefits, is people believe that if you put community benefits in a contract, then it would happen rather than actually monitoring it because contractors didn't really understand it and the clients didn't really understand it. Nobody was actually checking. Did they take on those trainees? Did those trainees turn up for a week and then wander off and never completed the six months that they were requested to do? You know, were the trainees, and this happens in a very, very, very rare number of cases, but were the trainees actually there at all, or was it a name on a piece of paper? So again, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but, but just to make sure the community benefits you ask for are the community benefits you're getting. If you're, if you're asking for community benefits by way of the trainee, then meet the trainee, find out the trainee's name, you know, do, do regular updates on how the trainee's going, talk to their college to see if they're still attending. Um, Community benefits, one of the problems, if they're not TR&T community benefits, is that by the time, as the contract drifts on and gets closer towards the completion, it might be slightly more difficult to get a commitment to doing things like, you know, if it's painting a community center, as the contract drifts on, then it's getting towards the end. You might find it more difficult to get the contractor to engage their staff and the resources to get it done within the lifetime of the contract. When the, co when the contractor leaves site, then you've got a problem because you've got to be bringing them back to do it. And then you've got real problems implementing those community benefits. Um, if you put them as KPIs, as key performance indicators in regular update meetings, then the contractor will believe that they are important to you. And that's why we recommend it as a core requirement because if it's in the OJU, if it's in the PQQ, if it's in the ITT, then they will believe that it's part of what you are buying and that they are responsible to deliver it for you. If it seems like an add-on, if it seems like something that's just been stapled on the back at the last minute, perhaps they won't give it the due attention it deserves. And if they, if they don't do it on that contract, the next contract they come to, they won't bother with it then either because they'll think, well, it was just a tick box exercise. It was a formality. So do yourself a favor, but do also do a favor to those people who are going to be contracting with these people after you take it seriously, then they'll take it seriously for their next contract. Okay, I have another um, frequently asked question. It's, um, it's, it's a bit of a cynical question actually, but um, it's something that, that we've often been asked, or ITI officers have often been asked, which is including community benefits in your contracts, does that just mean that the contracts become more expensive? Uh, thanks, Judy. Um, it's, it's commonly assumed that um, that if you include targeted recruitment and training, that it, it'll be unaffordable and it'll be an additional cost and, and won't provide you value for money. Um, but there, there have been examples that we are looking to include, uh, particularly in in the refresh of the toolkit that Rachel was talking about, from organisations such as Glasgow Housing Association, and they recognise that that needn't be the case. Um, something to remember is that uh, afford affordability um, and, and value for money, um, leading on from what Rachel said, are uh, best addressed to consideration at an early stage of what targeted recruitment and training requirements should be included and to design those so that they can fit in with, uh, with the resources that you've got at your disposal. Um, as I said, the example that we had from Glasgow Housing Association was that uh, prior, prior to any study on this, that there, there wasn't any sufficient evidence of, uh, of the impact of including TR and T uh, in a contract in, in terms of its value for money. Um, but uh, they, they did a, a scoring exercise on hundreds of, of uh, PQQs and uh, a number of TR and T method statements. Uh, and they concluded that uh, the inclusion of targeted recruitment and training requirements at all stages of procurement didn't deter bidders at all, uh, and that bidders 
with highest scores overall uh, were also those that scored highest on the TRNT requirements. Uh, in, in all cases, the, the community benefits requirements um, helped the, the contracting authorities to achieve uh, their policy objectives and it, and it didn't cost them any more, um, no additional cost to their contracts at all. Yeah, I, I'd just add to that, Gareth, is, is um, when this comment comes up, and it usually comes up when we're delivering training on community benefits, is, um, is it not just going to be dumped on the top of the contract cost? You'd first answer, well, yes, that could be the case, but if a contractor dumps too much on top of the contract cost for delivering community benefits, then they might price themselves out of the contract as it is. They're more likely to be able to deliver it cost effectively because they have the resources to do so. I mean, if you were, a, as an independent organization, going to deliver training individually to people, it would cost you more than a contractor could do it for if he's doing it in-house himself because he has the access to the resources. Um, and um, I've completely lost my train of thought now. That's OK. Thanks. Do we have any more questions, John? Do we have any more questions, John? No. Um, well, I think we will um, end the uh, the webinar there actually because we've had quite a quite we've shown you quite enough um, of the new stuff that you're going to have to take on board for I2I I and community benefits and procurement. Hopefully, it's been of really good use to you. Just to remind you that we do have a lot of resources available on the website www.cih.org forward slash I to I, that you can access free of charge at any time. There's also contact information on there for you to get in touch with the team. If you want some one-to-one -one advice, please do so. Um, just like to say thank you for participating in this I to I webinar on behalf of myself, Rachel, Gareth and John. A recording has been made and it will be available on the website for next week. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been useful to you. Please do visit the Can Do Toolkit. It's free of charge on the website. Um, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Goodbye.